All right, good morning, folks, and uh, welcome to today's webinar. Our webinar today is titled, Three Approaches to Optimizing Your Selenium Test Designs. Our focus this morning is going to be on tutorials and code samples to show you some of the best practices for developing Selenium tests. Uh, and just a reminder, this webinar is jointly produced by Qualitest and Soft Labs. Uh, Qualitest is one of our, our premier partners. A uh, reminder, we will be recording the session today. We'll be sending out uh, a link to the recording uh, a day or two after the webinar, so you feel free to share that with your colleagues who may not be able to uh, make it to this live event. We have lots of people on the, the webinar this morning. We had over 1,000 people register for this, but you'll only see probably your name uh, in the right-hand uh, participant list uh, because of the privacy concerns. Uh, finally, in the lower right-hand corner, uh, there's a chat window. We encourage people to ask questions in that window, and as time uh, permits, we'll, we'll respond to different questions uh, from our two speakers. So with that, uh, we will get started. Uh, this morning, we've got a couple of great speakers. Uh, Brian Van Stone, who's the solution architect with Qualitest. Uh, Qualitest, again, is a partner of Soft Labs, and they're one of the world's largest pure play QA and software testing companies. And we have Neil Manvar with Soft Labs, who leads our solutions architecture group. He has extensive experience in design and implementation of Selenium tests, and he has done this at a very, very large scale uh, for some, some of the world's best known companies. Uh, a quick uh, agenda, we're going to talk about, again, good design approaches with Selenium. There'll be three different models of designs that we're going to talk about, uh, page model object, behavior-driven design, as well as keyword-driven design. Uh, there'll be a discussion about the pros and cons of the diff different met methodologies. We'll also be uh, uh, using some of your questions during the webinar to keep this more of a conversational kind of event, and then certainly have time for Q&A at the end. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Brian and have him kick us off. Thanks so much, Ken. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, just want to kind of introduce what we're going to be talking about here today, um, a little bit beyond what, what Ken just told you guys. Uh, really what we're focusing on here today is the, the importance of design and test automation. Because when it comes to any test automation endeavor, design is so important to success. Um, so what the, the strong design is going to enable us to produce consistency in our test automation, it's going to make our test automation more reliable, it's going to reduce the cost of maintenance, allow us to develop our tests faster, make sure that our results are as accurate as possible, and especially allow us to address some of what Selenium does not. Because Selenium is one of those tools that's very, very good at what it does, but it's not an end-to-end -end test automation tool like QTP or Test Complete or, or you know, Rational Functional Tester. Selenium is about driving a browser. But what's really nice about that is kind of the, the pure-bloodedness of Selenium enables us to really have extremely strong control over how we implement our test automation and how we get what we really want to get out of it. Um, so with that being said, I think really as we go through this, just keep in the back of your mind how design is so important with test automation. You don't want to be just, you know, writing these one-off test scripts. I have a test, you know, test A, so I write a script for test A. I have test B, I write a script for test B. It's really not going to get you where you want to be in the long run. Um, so you want to settle on a, a good design approach right out of the gate and make sure that you adhere to it as you move forward. So with that, um, let's start talking about what are some of the different approaches that are available to us. And most of these that we're going to talk about are pretty mainstream. I think you guys have probably heard of all of these, um, but we'll, we'll just kind of be highlighting some of, the, some of the really good ones, some of the really important ones to, to have a good handle on. And the first one there is the page object design pattern. So what is page object design? Basically what we want to do is we want to model the UI components of the application under test as page objects. And these page objects serve two very important purposes. First and foremost, they expose the services of a page to the developer of the tests. And what do I mean when I say they expose the services of the page? Basically, what a page object does is essentially becomes an API into the functionality of the user interface of our application. So we take all of those things that you can do with the interface, and we expose them through page objects. So then performing a a task or, or some sort of action against the application under test is as simple as invoking a method against the page object. Kind of the other side of the coin, what this does is it abstracts away all that deep knowledge of the page structure away from the test. 
So because we've modeled the UI in these page objects and we've exposed its functionality as essentially an API off those page objects, we no longer care about what the interface looks like. We just care about what we can do with it. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of an approach like this? What we end up with with page object design is really high tolerance of changes in the user interface. And this is because of that, that abstraction away from the structure of the page. So now, if anything changes in the user interface, we know exactly where to change it. And we can go make that change in the floor. Yeah, sorry, it looks like we lost uh, Brian's audio here for a second. Uh, we'll try and uh, recover him shortly, so stand by. Uh, we just heard something there. Brian, you want to unmute? Brian, you back? Yeah. Neil, you want to take over while I try and figure out uh, what's going on with Brian? Yeah, no problem. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to take over for Brian here, Neil Manvar from Sauce Labs Solution Architects. So uh, Brian was going over the advantages with uh, page object, and he, I think he left off that you, there's re reduction in code duplication in that when uh, the markup changes or some pay part of the web app or mobile app that you're working on changes, uh, if, you're, if you've implemented the page object pattern correctly, there's only one place to sit, change that selector, or if some interaction changes, there's only one place where you need to change that interaction. Uh, another advantage is also a coupling of the object recognition and app functionality, and uh, that allows for you to move fast and uh, know what your app is doing and uh, what each page looks like. Some of the disadvantages now would be the cost of framework development, uh, meaning that you have to integrate page objects into your framework and, uh, and uh, have, your, have your framework uh, be around page objects and use it everywhere. Also, another thing is not ideal for all applications. For example, if you can't map your page object or your web app or your mobile app into the page object because it's dynamically changing, and uh, for instance, a game, for example, you wouldn't want a lot of page objects for. Um, so, but something like a web page, web page for email or some basic website, um, a page object pattern would prove very useful. Uh, in Ajax apps, it's actually very useful to use page objects as subparts. In, uh, as in your application. So page objects within page objects inheriting it, for instance, a message list and having message page objects. Um, and so it's not exactly ideal when pages are highly interactive and serve a large amount of content. And, and another disadvantage is that it requires a high degree of technical proficiency from the testing team, meaning that the testing team needs to know how to write good page objects and maintain them. Otherwise, you'll have a mess of page objects and it will actually hurt you in the long run rather than help you. So having, having you need to implement uh, page objects correctly and have uh, that proficiency and knowledge around. Hey, sorry to jump back in, Neil. Do you guys have me back? Oh, yeah, there you, there you go. Yeah. Could Excellent. You? All right. Cool. So thanks for taking over, Neil. Um, 
moving on, why would we or would we not consider page object? Because obviously we're presenting multiple approaches today and no one approach is going to be ideal for everybody. So part of what we're going to do as we explore these three approaches is kind of discuss what are some of the, the situations you find yourself in that would advocate or, or reason against a particular design approach. So why might you consider the page object design? Um, if you've got a lot of kind of workflow driven content that lends itself really well to automating use cases page by page, page object is, is absolutely excellent at doing that because it provides an extremely intuitive model to map that kind of functionality into an automation suite. So it's very, very good in that space. Additionally, if you if you're using an MVC design pattern for actually developing the application, there's a lot of really good synergy because things can map one to one very easily into a page object pattern in terms of the whole separation of implementation from presentation that MVC provides us with. Um, that, that can kind of map really, really well into this design approach as well. Um, why might you look into other options though? If you've got a lot of really interactive content that all gets served up on a single page, it can be somewhat less intuitive to try and map that into page objects. Um, you need to very intelligently lay out what is the hierarchy of your page objects and how do I actually break this user interface down into meaningful components? Because when you can't kind of go page by page, it puts a lot more strain on the, the tester who's designing the automation to, to clear that hurdle. Um, and additionally, what I've seen in the past a handful of times is that some organizations have a requirement or a desire to get these non-technical or less technical SMEs involved in the design and execution process surrounding test automation. Um, so this happens in often in very specific industries and doesn't really apply to everybody, but if you want that capacity where you have you have real SMEs that have deep industry knowledge and they need to take that knowledge and transition it over to an automated suite that accurately tests your application. You may want to consider another approach because of the highly technical nature of page object. As we said, your, your test team needs to be pretty technical as Neil was just going over on the last slide. Um, they need to be able to design, create, and maintain all of these page objects. And if there's, if there's a strong demand for deep industry knowledge around that, um, it may not be the best way to go for you guys. Still with us, Brian? Yeah, so we can, um, I think the, the next slide might be, Neil will show you guys a little bit about page objects. So here's just a basic example of a page object. I, I modeled it after the free trial page on Sauce Labs, uh, which is a free trial form to show a free trial form to show uh, to sign up for a free uh, to sign up for a free Sauce Labs trial, and uh, so basically this page models the form on it, and the, here you see that I have the ID of the form, and uh, as the and that's what's re and the browser dot find element which will return that Selenium element. So I've modeled the free trial form into this free trial page which I can access and use later. So anytime I'm dealing with the form, the only place I'll have to change it is right here. Um, now, what I'm gonna do is talk about page object and BDD. So here, BDD is behavior-driven development, which is a TDD technique where you would define the acceptance criteria and uh, write the test as you're writing the source code, but it also has enabled us to create better tools to do tests, such as Cucumber and RSpec. And today I'll be talking about Cucumber and demoing some tests in Cucumber using Selenium WebDriver, PageObject, and um, Sauce. So the output of BDD will be maintainable, readable, easy to use test cases. And uh, going on with the next slide. So the pros and cons of BDD is the requirements and behaviors are clear, and meaning that when you write the test case, you know exactly what's doing and exactly what the expected behavior should be, and it it can be read and understood by all. And you'll be sh you'll see that when I show the cucumber test case, and it, it's really easy to debug and maintain these test cases as well. Uh, because when something goes wrong, it maps directly to a line of some behavior or some 
uh, some action and you know what's going wrong. Also, the test case is from a user's perspective. So one of the cons is that another layer or technology is introduced into the tech stack, meaning that now you have to deal with something like Cucumber or um, RSpec uh, or whatever other BDD technology that you're doing. So your staff has to be trained in using this correctly, just like the page object pattern. The other part is the onboarding. You have to know how to write proper step definitions and scenarios and scenario outlines and also use regexes in the right way. Otherwise, you're just going to have a mess of test cases. So now I'm going to go on with the demo and show you a BDD test case. So here I've written two test cases against the Sauce homepage using Cucumber, Selenium WebDriver, and Page Object. So the first test case goes to the Sauce Labs homepage and then verifies the title is as expected. So. Need to share your so here, um, um, I've written two test cases against Sauce Labs. The first test case will go to the Sauce Labs homepage and then verify the title is as expected. So it'll go to saucelabs.com and then verify this title is as expected. The second test case will click the free trial button and then and verify the free trial form is present. So here is the second test case where it goes to the Sauce Labs homepage and click, clicks the free trial button and verifies that the free trial signup form is there. So let's see what these test cases are doing. So given on the Sauce Labs homepage, we'll go to saucelabs.com, as we see here. Then the title assertion, which is listed as the title of the page should be as expected, is right here, where I say the browser title is ex I expect that to be the text I provided. And clicking on the free trial button is done right here where I access the page object by doing page equal home page new at browser and then interact with that, that uh, object by clicking it. So I click the free trial button here. Similarly with the free trial steps, uh, here I just obtained the form page from the page object and verify it is displayed right here. Now just to showcase the page objects real quick. The home page, page object has the free trial button, which is that red button I click to get to, the, to see the free trial form. And I have the find element and the CSS selector for it. And in the free trial page, I have the form, which I've referenced by the ID. I've written a rate file to run all of these tests in parallel against Windows 8.1 Chrome, Firefox 40, OS X 10.9, Chrome 45, XP, Firefox 39, all in parallel on Sauce. So if I go and run this, all these test cases will run in parallel on Sauce in all the different configurations. And we can see that happening right here. That's pretty cool, Neil. So you can see eight VMs starting to kick off and then the test starting to run all simultaneously. Yep, exactly. So that was a demo of uh, testing using a BDD framework, Cucumber, which is right here, where you see the features, which maps to the step definitions, and also using page objects, where we can see here, where we click the page object free trial button, um, and here is the page object for that one right here. Yep, that was the demo. You want to get back to Brian? Thanks, thanks, Neil. Uh, Brian, we'll uh, if we'll get bring the slides back up and kick it back to you. Sounds great. Thanks, Neil. I think that that demo definitely highlights in a really succinct way the the power that you can get out of page objects and BDD together. Okay. So let me just get these up for you guys.
Perfect. Um, so the next one that I want to talk to you guys about today is, oh, do we have it coming up? There we go, is keyword-driven testing as a design approach to test automation. And so what is, what is keyword-driven testing? For anyone who hasn't experienced it before, KDT is an approach where we attempt to model the functionality of an application as keywords, which are then executed in combination to, to become the, the behavior we want to get out of our test. And KDT can kind of, in a lot of ways, be juxtaposed with page object design, where if you recall, with page object, we're modeling the UI to expose functionality of these objects as services for our code to consume. In KDT, we're kind of coming at it from the, the complete opposite angle, where we are attempting to model functionality, attempting to model business rules into keywords which are then executed. And what we do is we kind of, you know, the, the whole UI is implemented in the back end on the back of these keywords, but we're, we're really modeling the functionality rather than the user interface. Um, so in some ways similar, in some ways quite opposite from page object design. So what do we get out of KDT? There's a very strong and clear separation of design data and development. So keywords are generally designed to model business rules and business logic. They're developed in, in a way that they can consume different types of data um, so that you get that, that really clear separation between the three. And that becomes very, very important because KDT is largely a design-driven approach rather than a functionality-driven approach. <clears throat> What you also get out of KDT, just like a, a lot like we got out of BDD actually, where in BDD we, we have the, the domain specific language that the tests are actually written in, we get something very similar with KDT. So there's a capacity to understand what's going on with the test automation without much or any technical knowledge because these keywords are often put into some sort of custom interface or an Excel spreadsheet where you can actually read the flow of the test right in front of you and see which actions are being carried out against the application under test in a really easy to interface with way. Um, so you end up with a very strong abstraction away from the automation implementation and you get something that, that is much more about what are we actually doing with the application rather than how do we do it. Some of the disadvantages of KDT is you have to be really careful in how you design your keywords because you can create some, you can either create artificial dependencies between the keywords or you can discover real dependencies between the keywords that you didn't catch up front. Um, so what I mean by that is a situation where, let's say, you know, log into the application as a keyword and then navigate to the reports page is another keyword. Well, I must already be logged into the application in order to navigate to the reports page. And if the design of the keywords does not appropriately handle such dependencies, then you can have situations where executing the keywords in an arbitrary order will raise pretty meaningless exceptions that, that don't really help to troubleshoot what happened in, in any good or meaningful way. Um, Maintenance costs are generally managed more by design in this approach than by technical savvy, so to speak. Um, with the, the page object approach, you know, we have these page objects that, that give us that separation of the UI and the functionality and, and isolate all the changes. We need to be careful to design keywords under KDT in order to accomplish something extremely similar. And when done properly, um, you know, maintenance costs can, can be brought just as low as, as these other approaches that we're talking about. But again, it's driven much more by good design practices in creating these keywords than it is by a good implementation model for actually putting them together. One other thing about KDT, again, just kind of juxtaposed to the page object, it only thinks about application functionality, not objects in the application. So it doesn't really, there's nothing ingrained in the KDT approach to, to think about the user interface, never mind to mitigate risk associated with changes in the user interface. Um, so again, that's something that, you know, we need to be aware of up front and ensure that we create a good object recognition strategy. Because unlike a tool like uh, a QTP, which has an object repository, we don't have that with Selenium, and we're not getting it for free out of our design approach like we do with the page object pattern. 
So if you're going to go down the road of implementing a keyword-driven testing framework around Selenium, you want to make sure that one of the key things you design right up front is kind of a framework for handling objects in the application, and that's going to save you a ton of headaches in the long run. So if we can go to the, the next one from there. So why might you use or not use KDT? What kind of situations would you find yourself in? Um, you probably you might want to consider KDT if you've got a culture and support structure tending towards business-driven test design rather than UI-driven test design. Um, so especially if you're working in an industry that has really complex business rules, like for example, let's say in healthcare you have to process medical claims and there's a lot of data moving in all kinds of directions to all kinds of parties and there's really, really complex rules about what to do with that data. Um, you could buy a book that's three or 4,000 pages that details all of the diagnostic codes that, that could go onto your chart when you have a doctor visit. And there's lots of really important, important business rules about how that affects what happens to your medical claim moving forward. So when you've got really complex business rules like that, KDT can be better sometimes than trying to model the interface of an application. Because what we really care about is what are the business rules that are being processed in the back end so that we can design our tests around those rather than around the buttons on a page or something like that. Um, if you have, and I think everybody will, a uh, desire to separate design data and development in a strong way, I think all of these approaches really do that for you. Um, but what can happen sometimes in particular organizations is there will be you know, groups that have a good handle or responsibility for the test data and other groups that, that can do the test development. And if you, these are kind of segregated across different groups in your organizations, that can be a little difficult um, to deal with, but since KDT kind of separates those for us in a meaningful way, that means that we can each do our job and continue to function well together. <clears throat> one of the other really important things, and, and I've definitely run into this one in the past and I touched on it earlier, is the requirement to have these non or less technical personnel interact with the automation. And again, that happens more in environments that have really complex business rules behind their applications. Um, the other thing that's really nice about KDT, though, is that it's really easy to data drive your tests um, because of that separation of the, the functionality from the, the data layer. But why might you not want to go with KDT? Why might you look into something else? Um, if you've got a lot of dependent functionality, it's going to be really hard to mitigate those real dependencies between different keywords, and then it might make sense to go with a more UI modeled approach rather than a functionality modeled approach. Um, so you can definitely model workflows in KDT, but if you've got really complex ones that, not complex in the terms of what's happening in the back end, but if you have complex workflows on the front end, then those dependencies within the user interface can present some challenges. Um, but if you want to keep your test automation technical um, and reduce your design overhead, that might be another, another reason to look at something else. Page object is definitely a much more technical approach, as is BDD at its heart. Um, so if you don't want to have all that design overhead in creating these keywords, what are the inputs and outputs, what kind of data can they consume and not consume, um, all of that stuff happens up front, and there can be a lot of design overhead associated with it. Um, but depending on what you're looking for, that can also be uh, a necessity to, to accomplish your goals. So moving from there, I think what I'll show you guys is I'm going to go through some code samples to kind of give you a platform to, to leap from if you want to try and implement a KDT framework on your own. And what I would suggest is the first thing you want to do is start with what is a keyword, right? So the first thing I did in the talk was define what is KDT and what are keywords, and that's kind of how you want to tackle developing a framework too. What I would suggest is you create a generic keyword and you come up with a concept for what is, what is the execution flow of a keyword? How do I run a keyword? Um, and a lot of the time it makes sense to have, just like we do with objects in any object-oriented language, we need a way to initialize it, a way to consume it, and potentially a way to, to clean up after it, after the fact. Um, so that's exactly what you'll see here. It's just kind of a, a scaffold suggesting that we should have a way to initialize the keyword, a way to execute the keyword, and a way to clean it up. And it's important that there 
also be a way to clean up after a keyword in the event that an exception occurs while initializing or executing it. So you'll see I've got two signatures in there uh, for the cleanup method, one that handles the situation where exceptions have occurred. So kind of, you know, design that, that overall execution flow, scaffold it out, and you'll be well on your way. Um, one other thing I want to suggest that you think about right up front is you want to devise a strategy for how you're going to share data between your keywords and as well as between your tests. Um, because keywords take your business logic and segment it out into these individual units, sometimes, you know, you, you need that username in multiple keywords, but it was only accepted as an input in one place. Um, so you're going to need a way to carry data throughout the flow of a test. One thing that I've done in the past that I think works pretty well is um, you can use an implementation of the singleton pattern to create something that is sort of similar to like a, a session object if, you, if you've done any web development in the past. When you, when you connect to a web application, there's some session object in the background that keeps track of your individual session with the application. You can use the same kind of concept to create what I'd like to call a test context that allows you to kind of share data across keywords within a test. And within that test context, you can, you can have different scopes, one that, you know, is for the current test run, one that's for the current test suite that I'm executing, and so on, whichever scopes make sense to you. After you've got the keyword in place, um, let's move on to the next one here. You're going to want to start setting up the framework for how you actually go and execute things. So you're going to have some core driver of the framework, which is basically the, the interface through which we execute everything. And um, normally when you put together a KDT framework, you have some sort of front end on it, a spreadsheet, some XML files, JSON, something like that that defines what tests am I going to run, what are the different keywords that compose these tests that I want to be able to execute. Um, so when it comes to the core driver of your framework, it's basically got to be able to do three things. It's got to be able to parse in whatever that input is for what tests you're going to run and what the keywords are in them and things like that. And at this point, reflection is your friend. If anyone is not familiar with uh, reflection, it's definitely something to look into. Java has a reflection API, C Sharp, so on. All the, all the object-oriented languages usually have something like this. Basically, reflect, reflection is, is code that can look at your code um, and find things and do things with them. It's, it's wonderful. And the reason this is so important is because if I'm driving my KDT framework with a spreadsheet or XML files or JSON, some sort of text-based input, then I need to be able to take the name of a keyword and go find that keyword so I can actually instantiate the appropriate object and go about executing it. Um, so one thing that, that I found a couple of years ago when I was doing this is that reflection was kind of the key to unlocking um, you know, a, a smooth and easy to use KDT framework. Beyond that, it needs to be able to run everything. So this is where you'll kind of control the execution flow of your framework for each test case, execute each test step, and so on. Make sure that you're gracefully handling your errors and kind of put that all together in one spot. And then, you know, generate a test report either all at once at the end um, or, you know, as you go along. These are kind of details that, that fall into place to some extent. And then the last thing is we need to be able to actually kick this thing off. And the easiest way to do it, and probably a great place to start, is instead of throwing some fancy interface on the front of it where you can kick off your tests and everything, just take in some command line arguments. Like if you're doing it in Java, have a, have a main method that can take in all the arguments, tell it what your input is, what tests you want to run, and kick it off that way. Um, this is really easy, too, because then you're not tying yourself to any platform you can very easily spin up a batch file or, or a shell script that, that kicks this thing off and integrate it with a lot of other systems really, really easily. Um, so this is generally the easiest and best way to do it. You could go with a, a more heavyweight approach to how you actually execute your tests, but just running your framework from the command line should be really good in most cases. Moving to the next one, let's see. So. When we actually want to make keywords, what we can do is, now that you, once you've got the core framework in place, you know what a keyword looks like, you can go about executing these keywords, you can start to kind of build mini keyword frameworks. Um, so what you see on the screen is, is kind of the scaffold for a keyword that would, an abstract keyword, and that's really important, that would manage 
connection, creation, and reuse. Um, so this keyword is, you know, you could expand on this to, to manage database connections, let's say. And then when it comes time to actually have a real keyword that does something with the database, that real keyword that does something doesn't have to do all the connection management. I don't have to discover if a connection is open, open a new one if it's not. I don't, I don't have to do all of that when I actually want to implement a real keyword that represents business logic because I can have that in this abstract keyword here. So you would never use this connection keyword as part of a test script, but you might write another keyword, which is run this uh, report out of the database and process the results, give it some name that makes sense, which extends connection keyword. And we don't have to worry about, about any of those details. We can have it all managed in one place. We can have, you know, connection clean up, uh, you know, quietly closing connections or rolling back transactions if necessary as part of the cleanup routine. Um, but we don't have to worry about doing all of that stuff when it comes time to do our real work, which we'll see on the next page is, is kind of the culmination of why KDT is kind of cool. If we move to the next slide here. So I write some keyword. I want to do something with a database, let's say. You notice in the init method, all we've got to do is handle arguments that are specific to this keyword. Um, and all of the generic stuff, because it extends connection keyword, happens over there in that other class that we write. And then I define the way we execute this keyword in the exec method. I do stuff with my connection, as you'll see in my, my comment there, my conda do stuff. Um, so the idea being, once we get down to implementing concrete keywords in a KDT framework, we only have to write the code to do the things we're really trying to do in the first place. And we can construct this hierarchy of, of abstract keywords that takes care of all the nitty gritty details in the back end. So we've got less boilerplate code, less, you know, no code duplication. Um, the maintenance costs stay nice and low because I've got a smaller, m smaller code base that actually needs to be maintained because a lot of that generic functionality that I'm never going to have to change is all abstracted away from me. Um, and that makes your life a lot easier moving from this point forward. Hey, um, we had a question uh, on the last slide about if you could you may do a quick summary of what reflection is. Sure. Um, so as, as I started to say, reflection is kind of introspective code. Um, so the way it works in Java, for example, is I can say, go look in package X and find me the class named Y. And then I get basically an instance of the class which I, from which I can instantiate objects. Um, so generally what we end up doing is you have keywords that are organized into packages as makes sense according to application functionality. Um, so I can say, you know, a package for application A, which has, you know, a subset of functionality related to, um, I don't know, let's say claims processing, since I was talking about the healthcare stuff before. Um, so in application A, there's a package for claims processing, which contains all of the keywords related to claims processing in application A. Um, and then my front end, the spreadsheet would say, you know, look in application A for the keyword called uh, reprice claim. Now in the code, what we can do is we can say, okay, go look in the package A, discover a class called reprice claim, instantiate it, initialize it, execute it, clean it up, and move on. Um, so it allows us to bridge that gap between a really easy to use front end and some complex things that are happening in the background. Is that, does that make sense? Terrific, thanks. Cool. So at this point we've talked about three different approaches and we've given you some of the details that hopefully would allow you to kind of springboard into implementing them on your own as well. Um, hopefully you have a good idea of, of what, are, what are the advantages and disadvantages of these different approaches, but what really I want you guys to walk away from this webinar with is the core concept that you've got to do something, that you need some sort of solid design approach because it's going to make your life so much easier, it's going to make you implement your automation so much more efficiently and be able to maintain it easier you need to have some sort of design approach. Design, design, design. This is what I tell people when, when we're talking about building an automation framework and they say, well, what kind of automation framework should I build? And I say, 
You build something that makes sense, but definitely build something. Don't fall into the trap of just creating test scripts for individual tests and thinking that this is going to be okay moving forward because they'll never change the interface for that part of the application um, because they definitely will. And that's, that's a reality that we have to live with is that test automation does inherently have maintenance costs associated with it. And what we have to do is try to mitigate those maintenance costs. We cannot eliminate them, but we want to make them as small as possible. So you really want to focus on reducing your maintenance costs and you want to pick the approach that best fits what you're doing at your organization and what applications you're working with, which is why we kind of took the pros and cons approach and the why would you use it, why would you not um, as part of the talk because it's not a one size fits all kind of scenario. Um, well, you can, maybe you can make the argument, page object works for everybody. Everybody should just do it that way. Well, in reality, there could be something better. Um, there could be plenty of design approaches that no one has even thought of yet. Totally different ways to do things. This happens all the time. We live in a world where there's new technology coming out every single day that ideally makes what we do easier. And um, you've got to be open to considering these different approaches, kind of measuring it against what's going on in your organization and picking the one that's right for you. And that's, that's really what we want you guys to do, hopefully, when you walk out of here today. Terrific, Brian. That was, that was great. I know uh, a lot of people ask about uh, uh, code repositories and code samples. And I know uh, Neil Vanvar on GitHub has a lot of sample code repositories and sample tests that uh, people can access publicly. Uh, so if you just search GitHub for Neil Manvar, you get the spelling of his name from the slides and the recording. We'll send that out later. Brian, do you have any any kind of samples or, or, or a repository that people might want to look at as well? That they want to I don't have anything. Study? I don't have anything out there live right now. Um, but if I decide to spin something up, I'll I'll definitely give it to you, Ken, so that you can kind of broadcast it out to all the attendees and let them know. Terrific. Uh, we've got a couple of questions uh, coming in here, Brian, so maybe I can uh, run these by you. Uh, one is, do any of the three design approaches uh, work better or is one best to work with test NG? Um, when it comes to test NG, I would say the most fluid one is probably going to be page object design because it is, it is the one that makes the weakest attempt to abstract really far away from the technical details and get you thinking about um, application functionality or business logic. So behavior-driven development is about modeling behavior and KDT is about also modeling behavior, whereas page object is about modeling UI and it's more technical in nature. Um, so that one's the easiest to integrate with. I would say of the three, KDT is the hardest to integrate with something like TestNG. And that's why in a lot of KDT implementations, you'll see that people will forego using things like TestNG and rather, you know, roll out their own front end for organizing and executing tests and maintaining them. Um, it can be done, but it's a lot less intuitive with an approach like KDT. Yeah, so there's a follow-on question which, you know, is there a situation where one would kind of intermingle these design approaches or is it just do you strictly stick with one design approach per, per test? So um, since what page object does is really expose an API of your interface, it can definitely be mingled with just about any other approach. And you actually saw in Neil's demo about BDD in the back end, those were actually page objects that he was interacting with. So he was using page object as an API to support his BDD approach. And the same can be done with KDT as well. Um, and I think out of these three, those are the two use cases that would make the most sense for that kind of intermingling of the design approaches. Is it pretty easy to, to, to switch between the different design approaches? I mean, does, or does it take just, you know, specialized knowledge and experience with, with each type? So is this asked from, if you can tell from the question, the perspective of someone who has experience with one and wants to know what that transition would be like to go to another? Yeah, I was paraphrasing. Uh, the question is, uh, how difficult is it to change from one design approach to another in the case, in the case we feel another one would be better? Uh, for example, they're using, uh, we use page object model with Selenium and TestNG. Okay, so this is the situation where you already have automation implemented on top of one design approach and you want to consider moving to another one. Um, it depends 
how much effort you put into building your own frameworks in-house versus kind of using third-party tools. Because if you went with, you know, something like TestNG and you found a page object API as some third-party library and you kind of put those together, then your framework design, your framework implementation overhead was probably fairly low in the initial effort. And in that case, then, you know, it's, it's not an enormous effort to transition to something else. Um, what I would watch more carefully than the technical aspects is how translatable are your actual tests from one paradigm to another. Um, because if we were to take a look at what does the average page object test look like versus a BDD test versus a KDD test, they look very different from each other. And transitioning all of that logic behind what the tests are, how they're written, and what they're actually doing is much more Oops, Brian, I think uh, we lost you again. Um, oh. You back, Brian? Hello? Do we have me? Oh, there you are. Sorry about this. All right, here I am. Sorry about that. Um, so kind of in summary, I think I know where you lost me. Um, <laughs> the technical hurdles are much easier to clear than the hurdles of actually translating your tests from one paradigm to another. So you want to take a look at trying to estimate how much effort it is to actually take that page object test in TestNG and turn it into a KDT script or a BDD script. Um, beyond that, BDD specifically kind of necessitates a huge change in kind of behavior, mindset, and culture around how you develop your applications. Um, so that is a much larger transition than just changing the way you test. Yeah, great. that's great, Brian. Hey, there's another question here kind of along the same lines. Uh, this person uses uh, object rep repositories, and they're using JSON, but they also have used databases. Is there, a, a, is there another method that might be better? Um, I think JSON is fine. I think maintaining you know, small lightweight fly files that support hierarchical object structures is really what you want to shoot for. Um, so, you know, JSON objects will let you kind of say, okay, this is my, my page and this page has child objects, which are forms and the forms have child objects, which are buttons. Um, so JSON and XML are probably most natively suited for that purpose. And I don't think that it's, there's not an enormous reason to invest a lot of time and effort into doing something more complicated when the, the simple and intuitive approach works just fine. Uh, on a slightly different track, uh, there's a question here about uh, responsive design, about responsive automation testing. Can you comment on that and how, how these approaches might apply? So I assume that's more like mobile, mobile responsive testing. Yeah. Um, do we still do we still have Neil on the line or uh, Neil? No, unfortunately Neil's not not with us anymore. Okay, um, I think he would probably be better suited to answer this question than I would. So maybe we can get back to this question asker after the fact. Great. Okay, we'll follow up on that one. Uh, and one more question here about uh, what is the best way to automate batch text files, jobs, and related scenarios. So batch text files, jobs, and related scenarios. So lots of uh, scheduled tasks and, and low level, you know, kind of interface list functionality. Um, it sounds like page objects would probably not be the, the right way to go. So are, are we dealing with a web application in this scenario? Probably not. Is it apparent yeah, at all from the context of the question? No, it's not. That's all they really ask. So we, we, can, so, we can probably... Well, one of the things I like about KDT, and this is kind of something I didn't bring up because it's less relevant to the, the Selenium user base, but we might as well say it now, is that um, keyword-driven testing isn't tied to the interface. It's tied to the functionality. So anything you can write code to do, you can write keywords to do. Um, and the same is true of BDD. If you don't back it with page objects, you can, you know, you, if you can write code to do it, you can automate it. Um, so those two approaches would definitely have a leg up in that arena. Uh, another question here, uh, this person is uh, looking to start implementing automated tests uh, to get started and keep things simple. And I think this is a key, of, a key approach that everybody wants is what's the simplest way to start. Would page-driven testing be the best approach for starting out? If you're looking to keep it simple to get off the ground from a technical standpoint, page object is the most lightweight. 
Um, it doesn't require a huge paradigm shift. It doesn't require a really complex framework behind it. It just requires that you be able to, on a technical level, get things done. So it's probably the quickest to get off the ground. If what you mean by keep it simple is keep the front end user interaction with the automation simple, then that's where you, you probably want to go the BDD or KDT route. And then uh, one question here, is there any approach that uh, applies better to doing uh, mobile testing? Um, so again, I think just like with web mobile testing, you want to ask yourself the same kind of questions. Do I want to model the interface and the way you interact with it? Do I want to model my business rules? Um, do I want to do the full paradigm shift to BDD? The questions are really the same. I think in the most common cases, mobile is going to lend itself very well towards page object because mobile applications are usually built towards usability and simplicity. Um, so modeling the user interface is typically what you want to do in that scenario, but that's not always the case. So you want to make sure that you, you don't just settle on page object without thinking about the other things, even though that's probably where you're going to end up. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much, Brian. I think that kind of brings us to close to the top of the hour, and so we'll, uh, we'll close out the webinar now. We'd like to thank everyone who attended uh, today and remind them that we will be sending out a link to, to the recording for this, and we hope that you'll share it with your colleagues who were not able to attend this live session. Uh, we'll also try and answer some of these other questions that have come up that we didn't have, have time to get to. Again, uh, Brian Van Stone from Qualitest and uh, Neil Manvar from uh, Soft Labs, thanks very much, and thank you all for attending today.